Or hymns, uh, how often I wonder whether or not we even know that which we're proclaiming or that which we're singing. Just out of curiosity, how many of you know why we say, here I raise mine Ebenezer? Anybody know where that comes from? It happens to come from 1 Samuel chapter 7, where uh, Israel suffered its greatest defeat, uh, perhaps in its nation's history, and then they had their greatest victory. And upon that victory, they raised a stone up uh, that they called Ebenezer to say, the Lord is my help. And so when we sing that line, here I raise mine Ebenezer, we are singing about the victory that we have in Christ, and specifically that we are setting up a memorial, as it were, to to shout, to proclaim, to sing the praise of how we need God's help each and every day. So you can stick that one in your hip pocket. Uh, It's free, and you can trip somebody up the next time you play Bible trivia at home. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 down to verse number 2. And I want to speak on the subject matter this morning of a grace that calls me to death. A grace that calls me to death. With your permission this morning, I want to move ahead uh, in our study of our Roman letter. We've been here now 30 weeks And I want to skip chapter 11, not because it's unimportant. It's actually a a very fascinating section of Scripture about how God is grafting the Gentiles in uh, to His covenant of grace and how that works in the history of time. But rather, I want to skip ahead just because I believe uh, time constraints, it would be good to do so. And so I want to go to chapter 12 this morning, and I want to move our discussion into one of the more important questions that as believers in Christ, we should have about grace and God's dispensation of it, or how he gives to us grace. Again, throughout the letter, Paul has spoken, and we've been studying about the magnificence of grace. He began with the bad news, right? He began with the reality that you and I are lost, that we are undone, that we are helpless before a holy God, that we are sinful by nature without the capacity or the ability to earn his favor or his righteousness on our own. That is, That Paul began his letter with the simple truth that you and I are helplessly lost in need of grace, in need of forgiveness, because if we were to try to earn God's favor on our own, we could not accomplish that. And we know that not only because Paul declares it as a part of God's inerrant and sufficient word, but we know that by experience, don't we? We know by experience that none of us are perfect, and if God's standard is perfection, we will never reach it upon our own. But then he moves from there into the good news, which is that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son into the world to die our death on the cross of Calvary so that we might be reconciled to God, that we might be brought near, that we might be considered beloved and blameless and even declared perfect and righteous. And from there, we moved in along in the glorious letter as we discovered that this has been God's plan from the very beginning, even before the beginning itself. That is, that God has never had some plan B in the world, but rather that he did not alter or change course in human history as he looked upon our sinfulness and the fall of Adam and Eve, but rather God has been working out this marvelous plan of grace from the very beginning of time, even before the beginning of time, in eternity past, for his own glory, that we might give him praise and that we might honor him among the nations." As a result of that, the last two weeks, the apostle brought us to a place of decision in Romans chapter 10. First, there was the simple decision of a call. That is, that he wanted us to simply believe in Jesus Christ. In childlike faith, to believe that what Christ did on the cross of Calvary was good enough to pay the penalty for our sin. And I like that expression, childlike faith, because we've even experienced it in our own home as we've been working with our kids and talking to them about believing in Christ. Listen, Mrs. Zariah doesn't understand the doctrine of atonement. She doesn't understand the doctrine of of justification. She doesn't understand uh, the doctrine of inerrancy or any of those things. What she knows is that mom and dad have taught her over and over again, and she's heard in Sunday school classes and in Awanas that she's a sinner, and she's beginning to understand what that means, and that she needs to call out to Christ and believe that what he did was enough to pay the penalty for her sin, and that he will take her home to live in heaven with her. That type of childlike faith, that's what we're called to. And from there, then, Paul, second of all, last week was a simple commission that he issued to us to get engaged in the battle, to go and to share the gospel, this wonderful gospel, this good news with a lost and dying world. 
And I don't know if somebody, uh, uh, I don't know what happened with something that was in the water last week, but we should have been more excited about that. I hope we were excited about it. When we left this place, we should have found somebody that needed to hear the good news of Jesus Christ because that was our commission. Because of what you've received, go and tell somebody else. Tell them, uh, tell a lost and dying world about the hope that there is in Christ Jesus. Now, if you're like me this morning, I love good literature, and maybe you like to read as well. And one of the things I find fascinating about literature is that good literature has the ability, has the ability within the writer to, to bring his story along to some culminating moment, some moment of impact, as it were, to bring the pages together to a place of conclusion. And in so many ways, that's where we're coming to in the Roman letter. You see, Paul has laid out his story in Romans, which is a theological treatise on the magnificence of grace. But now as we come to Romans chapter 12 and the chapters that proceed from there, we're coming to that culmination, that moment of impact, as it were, to the conclusion. And as he does so, what he's going to do is he's going to begin to take up questions, I think, that have plagued Christians, and this is why I wanted to move there this morning, that have plagued us for centuries and are very personal to us. Over the last several years, I found many believers with a burden. I found many believers that have a burden on their heart to say, what's next? What am I supposed to do because of what Christ has done? They've trusted in Christ and the grace they've received has oftentimes led so many believers to instinctively ask the question, what can I do because of this? What, what must I do because of this? What may I do for God in return for all that he has done for us? And the question is always what? What do I do? We ask questions like, what is God's purpose in my life? What am I supposed to be doing this morning? And I think oftentimes when we ask those questions, we tend to think on a very grand scale, don't we? We miss the simple things of life and we ask questions like, what does God want me to do? And we imagine going to the far ends of the earth or we imagine doing these big constructs or whatever it is, we think in the grandest of scales. I've also seen in 20 years of pastoral ministry, the opposite end of that spectrum as well. And even I would say that there's a disturbing trend that is emerging more recently. And I want to be very, very careful with my words this morning at this point. I want to, it's not my attempt in any way this morning to be offensive because I know that I'm preaching to the choir. If you're here this morning, it is because you are faithfully committed to Christ, so to speak. And so I don't want you to misunderstand, but in order that you'll understand where I'm going with this, I want to give you some things that, to think a little bit about. At the height of the moral rise of the moral majority in American society in the mid-80s, if statistics are to believe, there were more than 70% of Americans that professed to be Christians. During that season, countless studies were published by folks like the Pew Research Group, and within our own denomination of Southern Baptists, we have an, a publishing arm known as Lifeway. It's interesting that they both agree that somewhere around the early 90s is when we hit the height of American citizens participating in Christian worship. In fact, Lifeway did a number of research studies in the 90s and collected data, especially from what we know as the annual church profile. And for the sake of time, I'm going to combine that data with other research and just share a bunch of statistics with you for a few moments this morning, just so that uh, you can understand where I'm going with this. In the early 90s, about 65% of Americans said that they attended church regularly. No matter which study you look at, the, the number ranged from 64 to 67%. So we're going to go with about 65%. What's interesting is that in all of those studies, they defined regular church attendance as three to four Sundays every month. Somebody turn to the person to your left and to your right and say, three to four Sundays, is that where he's going with this? Wait, the person to your left and right are down at the lake this weekend, so never mind. In the same period, roughly 37% of that 65% said that they also served in the local church on a regular basis, and 10% said that they were on mission, and they defined on mission as going on mission trips, whether that be to the ends of the earth or whether that be here locally. Let me bring that, those numbers in a little more specifically. Lifeway, the entity charged with such tasks uh, of distributing the annual church profile by Southern Baptist Convention, said their research suggested during that time that within its churches, roughly 41% of its members 
were involved in service, and roughly 19% were involved in mission endeavors, whether that, again, be here locally or to the ends of the earth. Now, that is the early 90s. By the mid-2000s, those numbers had not just changed, they had actually plummeted. By 2015, actually, is when we see the greatest of decline. Most research no longer even defined regular church attendance as three to four times per month, but instead, researchers began to define regular church attendance as one time per month you showed up at the church and participated in a worship service, and that number had gone all the way from 65% of Americans to 47% of Americans with further research suggesting that less than 10% of those 47% of believers were actually involved in serving in the local church, and listen to this number, and less than 1%, according to Lifeway, were going on mission, whether that be locally or across the globe, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I bring those statistics to the forefront this morning, not because I want to purpose anybody into guilt, but for us to see the conundrum and to ask some honest questions as they relate to Romans chapter 12, because they are difficult questions, but they are fundamental to the message, to the gospel that Paul is proclaiming. As we turn to Romans chapter 12, what we find is the apostle is working out the gospel in the church but also in the life of the individual believer. He wants to know, or he wants to declare, what has happened to you because of what Christ has done? Maybe I would ask you to ponder that question this morning. What has happened to you? What what have you done? What, What is the resultant work, or what is the resultant action because of your faith in Jesus Christ? Paul has argued extensively that you and I this morning, that we are not saved by works. That is, that there is nothing that you and I could ever do, no amount of good works, that would ever earn God's favor towards us. But then as he turns the page to chapter number 12, he doesn't intend to suggest that there are not tangible results, or if you grew up in church, you would hear the expression, fruits of the gospel. He's not suggesting that because we are saved and because we are saved apart from any good works, that the Christian becomes stagnant in some way, but rather what he wants to show us is that because of what Christ has done, there are things that should naturally proceed from a person as a result of that commitment to Jesus Christ. It's a little bit like doing marriage counseling, right? And I, Miss Kelly and I have needed a lot over the years, so let me tell you, right? And, and you, there, are, there are often times when you're sitting there having a conversation or I'm helping another couple and, and you say, well, do they need to do that or, or, or do I must do that? And, and oftentimes I'll respond in private because it's normally the men. I'll say, uh, no, you don't need to, but if you made a commitment to this individual, if you married them, you should want to do that. And then normally they'll say, you mean I should want to take out the trash on Tuesdays before the trash dumpster comes, right? He writes in verse number one here, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, right? By the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. There's something that should proceed out naturally out of that response to Christ. And naturally out of that belief in Christ, there's something that is supposed to proceed. What is that? Well, in order to understand it, Paul, here in verse number one, already does what he's done so many other times in his Roman letter, and that is that he takes us back to some Old Testament imagery. Specifically, he takes us back to the imagery of an altar. In fact, all throughout the Roman letter, Paul has used imagery of the Old Testament quite vividly and quite powerfully whether it was his discussion on Abraham and Isaac or whether it became his discussion on Moses, the apostles always bringing us back as we read through this letter, back to the Old Testament pages. And here, and perhaps more, no more, more eloquently than in Romans 3 and 4, when he draws us back to the death of Christ on the cross as being substitutionary or being like, similar to the system that God had established so many years ago. See, Paul leaned in Romans in chapter 3 and 4 on the Old Testament imagery of God's redemption to explain why Christ had to die. People want to know all the time, why did Christ have to die? Why didn't God just declare people forgiven? And to answer that question, Paul in those two, or two chapters in 3 and 4 shows us that God set up a system by which he will pay the penalty, by which penalty for sin that is committed must be satisfied. 
Justice must prevail. But he's not done. Here again, he draws us back to the Old Testament as he draws us back to the altar of redemption and its imagery. And for those that might be unfamiliar with it, allow me a few moments to give you a brief summary so that you might understand what it is that Paul is calling us to in this moment. Remember where the altar begins. As God's people are brought out of Egypt and they are brought into the wilderness, God has this marvelous plan that he wants to work out in their lives long before they are to come into the promised land. And a part of that plan was that God wanted to lay out his law. And his purpose in drawing out that law was not in some way to bondage or to reshackle those who had been set free, but rather in the giving of his law, he was showing them where joy, satisfaction, contentment could be. But namely, he was giving them a standard by which he expected them to live if they were his people. But knowing that it was going to be impossible for them and their children and their children's children to ever live up to this holy and lofty standard that he would lay out, as a part of that law, he established then a system of sacrifice where offerings could be offered for the purpose of justice and appeasing his wrath so that he might remain holy and just and they might be his people. Then in the wilderness, God gave the blueprints for what was known as the tabernacle. It was where God himself, his presence, rested. The high priest would come in and they would offer sacrifice on behalf of the people in the most sacred of spaces known as the Holy of Holies. And then as we move forward into history, very rather rapidly, if I might say so this morning, we come to the great King David who decide, determines, decides that he wants to build a temple for the Lord. He's determined that the canvas tent is no longer sufficient for the Almighty. And of course, God would not allow David to build it, but he allows Solomon to build it uh, there after David. And that's why it was known as Solomon's temple. The first temple would eventually be destroyed in the years to come and then rebuilt according to the design of the original tabernacle, or so they would say. But the history of all of that is only just one small piece of the story. What's important for our text in Romans 12 is the business that is being conducted that Paul wants to draw our attention back to in his imagery. Why was all of this happening? What was going on? Well, beloved, regularly within the tabernacle and then within the temple confines when it was built, animals would be sacrificed for sin, and you knew that already. Each animal had to be carefully selected, inspected for any imperfection or blemish. This indeed is what Jesus dri- why Jesus ends up driving the money changers out of the, out of the temple before his crucifixion because the priest had set up this elaborate scheme where you would bring an offering, a sacrifice to, to give that, with, that was without spot or blemish. And they would uh, look at it and they would say, no, 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 this one's got a spot or blemish. But it just so happens we have a perfect sacrifice over here that you can purchase from us. And then they would charge the people these absorbing amounts so that they were making his, his, his temple, as Jesus says, into a den of thieves and robbers. But they had to, if, if, in a perfect world, they would select their own sacrifice, their own offering that was perfect, that was without spot, blemish, and then they would bring it before the Lord. They'd give it to the priest who would sacrifice it, and then he would burn it upon the altar, and that fragrance or the smoke that came from it would, would then go underneath a curtain that was there in the Holy of Holies, uh, this veil. And if the smoke went under it, it was believed, they believed that that was God's sign of saying, I have accepted the sacrifice on your behalf. And likewise, if it did not, then God was rejecting their sacrifice. This all then would culminate on the most holy of days that is still celebrated today, but not in the same way because there's no temple, known as Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement. When the nation of Israel would gather together and they would offer sacrifice not only on their own behalf as individuals and families, but they would offer sacrifice on behalf of the entire nation itself. There's a lot of imagery in all of that, and much of it has to do with the spilling of blood. As each sacrifice is killed, the testimony of, it's a testimony of what sin cost and the justice of God, that God will not allow sin to go unpunished, unanswered. There's the individual and the communal repentance, the people confessing before God what they've done wrong, and it's somewhat of a gruesome sight while all of these things are going on. It's blood flowed from the temple, but it was all to show the people that God took the matter of sin seriously. There was a cost to it, that the justice of God needed to be satisfied, 
And that the avenue of grace that God had provided was belief in him, faith in him, believing that what he had said would come to fruition, that another would then face the consequence of sin on our behalf. Now, all of that then comes full circle for the apostle in the person of Jesus Christ, who is then God's offering for sin. For Paul, one cannot escape what Christ has done without looking at the entire Old Testament system and seeing, seeing how God had done all of this, but yet how he'd made something unique and distinct in Christ. You see, God was still requiring a sacrifice, Paul would argue, because his justice required that sin be atoned for, and the only way that sin could be atoned for was through the shedding of blood, but this time, things were going to be different. In the old way, the worshiper would bring his best sacrifice to God. He would go through his herd and try to find the the one animal that was without spot or blemish. I can even imagine some of those folks, like little Isaiah, last Christmas, I made a deal with them. I said, hey, listen, if we sell a whole bunch of these toys that nobody plays with anymore, you can have all the money. We'll take 10%, give it to the church, and the 90% you can have, and we'll go on a shopping spree for Christmas. I don't even care what you buy. I just want to get rid of all this stuff, right? And so Isaiah thought that was a good deal, a great deal, and so he goes down and pulls out all of his toys, and he comes up with like seven out of an entire room packed full of stuff, right? He's got seven toys that we're able to get rid of, right? Sell on Facebook Marketplace. And of the seven toys, six of them were broken, right? Because that's how we view these things. But in their world, they've got to offer, they've got to go through their their herd and find the very best because this is serious business. But for Paul, something has changed in Christ. You see, in Christ, it is not the worshiper who goes and provides the spotless lamb for sacrifice. Instead, God decided that he would provide his own sacrifice on our behalf. And in fact, he was his own sacrifice in the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. In both the Old Testament system and the New Testament in Christ, blood becomes a central theme. In the Old Testament, the blood signified the remission of sin, but it ultimately leads to the death of an animal. In Christ, Paul argues, especially at the Lord's Supper, we find the blood of Christ given as the new covenant for the remission of sin, but this time the lamb would not stay dead. He would rise again. And so whereas the old system had a spotless lamb the worshiper brought that would die, the new system, the lamb was provided by God the Father, and this lamb would not stay in the grave. And then there was the temple curtain found in that holy of holy places. Paul doesn't dive deeply into this, but it's important for our discussion here this morning. Remember, I said it divided out the temple. It separated the most holy of priests uh, uh, from the others who was allowed to enter in. And the fragrance of the offering, the smoke, had to go underneath that curtain to show God's favor. But in the sacrifice of Christ in Matthew's gospel, what we learn is that when Christ died, the veil was torn in two, showing us that both God had accepted the offering, both God had accepted the sacrifice, but also that no longer would there be barriers, but all were welcome to come in. God's presence was no longer offered to the most holy of priests, but now it was promised to all who believe in Christ And that is why Peter would refer to us as a royal priesthood. Why are you not more excited about this this morning? The apostle had drawn upon this imagery in Romans 3 and 4 to show that Christ is sufficient, that he is the perfect sacrifice so that you and I may be transported from one condition unto another, that we might be transported from that which God hated because of our sin to that which God loves because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Apostles drawn upon that imagery. But now there's a problem. You see, the system that Paul had proclaimed in his preaching of the gospel, the the system that he had laid out, it has one noticeably absent person. Who is it? Well, it's the worshiper. That is that in the system of grace that Paul has preached, the worshiper is not engaged at all. It is God who establishes the system by which sin can be forgiven. It's God who provides the sacrifice. It's God who is the sacrifice. And in Romans 9, it is God who elected his people from eternity past. So that leaves the worshiper just simply sitting idly by watching these things transpire. Or does it? For Paul, the answer is no. In verse number one, his argument really comes to its culmination 
We may have done nothing in the equation of justice. There is no good deeds, that is, that we may do that satisfy God. And His grace is given to us freely as a gift. But such a gift, Paul will argue, demands a resultant action. Namely, he says that we would, in verse 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Again, he returns us to that Old Testament imagery, why we would have spent so much time on it this morning. But this time, the worshiper doesn't have to look for a perfect sacrifice. No, Paul says he is the perfect sacrifice. He says he is holy and blameless. All the years I've heard this section of Scripture preached, this is the line that gets the least amount of attention. It is most often overlooked, and yet it is one of the most important fundamental lines in the entire verse. You see, what Paul is saying in that moment when he writes holy and blameless, he's saying that you and I are to offer ourselves to God for service, and anything that is ever offered to God for service must be blameless, must be holy, must be perfect. That word holy, it means to be set apart. It means to be a cut above the rest. Acceptable is self-explanatory. It means that we are found to be appropriate. So when he says that we are to offer our bodies holy and acceptable to God, he's stating a fact. That is, that in Christ, you and I have been made holy and blameless, holy and acceptable. And then because of that, we are to present our bodies as they are to him. That is that through Christ, God has made you appropriate as it were to be offered back to himself. You were made appropriate. Look back a few phrases. He says, by the mercies of God. So many in Christian life, they wait for their lives to be clean and perfect before they think that they can serve. I can't tell you the number of times I've approach people throughout the years and ask them, hey, would you be willing to serve in this capacity or another? And they'll oftentimes respond back with, I, I just don't think I'm capable of that. I'm not worthy of that. I'm not able to do those things. But you see, beloved, in a sweeping line, what Paul has done is he's told us that the good news of the gospel is that God has already made you holy and acceptable. <laughs> You don't have to wait to present yourself to God because you've got things in your life that need to be fixed. Uh, if you do, you'll never have opportunity to present yourself to God in the first place. We live in a Christian humility environment, I, I think sometimes at least, and we, we believe that it's incumbent upon us to confess our sin and, re, and confess our sinfulness, I should say, and, and we should, and that is right and good to do so. But did you also know this morning, beloved, that you are not just a sinner, but you are a saint, that God has already declared you as righteous today? Now, you may not experience that. We may not experience the fullness of that until we leave this world. But in this moment, God has already declared that I am righteous, holy, and acceptable to him purely on the basis that Jesus Christ died for my sin. God has cleaned me up. God has prepared me. God has cleaned you up. He has prepared you in order that you would present yourself back to him for service and use. There's another difference. In the old system, when a sacrifice was offered, it was dead. In fact, in order for a sacrifice to be made, the animal had to die. But Paul says that you and I are not in the same category. In fact, in his Corinthian letter, he says that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He argues in other places that we have life, life everlasting. And Jesus told the woman at the well that if she'd known who she was being asked to drink of, she would have asked him for a drink, that he would give her a drink that, that she may drink from the well that never runs dry. Paul says that you and I are to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. I feel like you're going to think I'm going to be too simple this morning, but let me give it a try. What do dead animals do? Nothing, unless they're in Stephen King's thrillers, right? What do dead people do? Nothing. But what do living people do? Well, we do a lot. We're moving. We're active. In fact, if we're not moving and we're not active, people might begin to think that we are dead, right? In fact, one of my great fears is being buried alive in a coffin. So I, when I'm in the hospital, I at least move my hand from time to time so that they know that I have not perished. Dead people don't do anything, but living people, they do. They move around, right? Right? 
So let me ask you a simple question this morning without trying to create some great offense. What does your service in God's kingdom more reflect today? Does it reflect a dead man doing nothing? Or does it reflect a living organism about moving around, operating, and and instinctively acting? One final difference. When the people brought an animal to be sacrificed, do you think the animal came willingly? Well, maybe. I mean, at first. I mean, when we... My grandfather was a hog farmer, and I can remember loading the hogs up in the truck, and the first hog that went in, he thought, man, this is great. I get a limo ride, right, in the big red truck. By the time you got to about that 30-second hog, they were starting to figure it out. This is not a good idea. You know, Bert, when he went last week, he didn't come back, and I think I smelt him, right? Do you think that the animal came willingly? No. The scenes of the temple uh, animals being slaughtered probably would have had PETA red with anger, right? The animal is led to the place of slaughter, and then, catch this now, they bind the animal, they tie them, they hold them so that the priest can do his work. And yet, Paul says in this moment that we are to, and I'll give you the ESV version, present, or other translations read, offer. In other words, far from the picture of an animal being forced into sacrifice, led and bound, Paul says that you and I are to walk up to the altar and lay our lives down. That we just willingly go, that that this is a joyous experience of presenting ourselves for service in God's kingdom. This is what Paul says is our piece in the puzzle. You see, beloved, you and I can do nothing to redeem ourselves, but having been redeemed, Paul is making the argument that the resultant action is that we would joyfully come and place our lives upon the altar for service because we have already been made holy and acceptable before God. And then the apostle writes, which is your spiritual worship. You know, in the church, we spend a lot of time thinking about what worship is, even trying to define it. We think about music, we think about prayer, we think about the preaching and the study of his word. We even think about the corporate gathering of the saints, and all of those are pieces to the puzzle. But in this moment, Paul wishes to relay what God really expects of us because of what he has done for us in Christ. And what he wishes to relay is that we would just come and present ourselves before him, that we would come and present ourselves upon the altar of sacrifice for his service, whatever he deemed best. This is why I began with all of the statistics this morning. I would remind you of them, refresh your memory to them. Do those statistics, do they relay a sense of continual living sacrifices coming and presenting themselves to God to you? They sure don't to me. Does attendance once a month sound like a living sacrifice to you? It sure doesn't to me. Does withholding our money from God sound like a living sacrifice to you? It doesn't to me. Does unwillingness to serve sound like a living sacrifice? And I I know everybody's busy. It's a matter of what I choose to be busy with, in my opinion. Am I busy running to the altar to present myself to God, or am I busy avoiding the altar because I have too many other things going on? Again, I ask you, which do you resemble more? Do you resemble a living sacrifice or a dead sacrifice? In order that there might be no confusion this morning, and I fear somebody will mishear my words, I want to be abundantly clear. Some may hear these words and think legalism. They, they think, okay, you're saying I have to teach Sunday school, I have to attend Sunday school, I have to volunteer in the children's department, I have to send my kid to Awana, I have to serve as a trustee, I have to serve on a committee, I have to give my money, I have to do this and this and this. Beloved, if that is the message you have heard, you have missed it entirely because Paul's message is not a matter of legalism, it is a matter of delight. In verse number one, it is the delight of the redeemed to present or offer their bodies as sacrifice. The penalty for sin has already been paid. And so if it is, is it not then your delight to in return offer yourself as service? And if it is not, I would ask you the question of why. Why is it not a delight for you to serve God and his kingdom? And before you offer up the, well, I served once and I had a bad experience, I want to make two suggestions. First of all, what did you expect? If you're going to serve, you're going to have bad experiences because you and I serve with sinful people. And are you ready? We are sinful people. You see, if I'm in the room, you can be guaranteed there's going to be at least one 
colorfully sinful person in the room. Of course, sinful people do silly things from time to time. Of course, all of us do silly things from time to time. Of course, we'll have bad experiences. What do we expect? But second, and maybe this is more poignant to the text, since when did being a sacrifice not involve death? Since when did be offering ourselves as a sacrifice not offer some form of pain, turmoil? The question is one of response. Is Christ's sacrifice, beloved, on your behalf, worthy of you surrendering your own life in response? That's my question this morning. Is what Christ did enough? Is it worthy of you surrendering your life in response to him? And if it's not, then I would ask you the question, what is? What will you ever find that is? Further, what exactly is Christ asking of us today? What is the altar upon which we are supposed to lay our lives? What is the sacrifice that we are supposed to make? Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable. Boy, I wish I had a whole another hour uh, I mean, last week I got, let you out a minute early. That counts, right? I, I wish I had a whole other hour, but I, I don't. So let me just offer a couple comments first. The sacrifice is intricately connected to the mind, Paul says. Our minds, he says, are not to be conformed to this world. In other words, we're not supposed to think like the rest of the world. We're not supposed to think like the world thinks. We have different priorities. We have different attitudes. We have different motivations. We have entirely different imaginations. But the problem with the mind is that the mind is always fixated on what it's set upon. So if you're constantly setting your mind on worldly things, then what will the mind be fixed upon? It'll be fixed upon worldly things. How do I set my mind on something? It's a phrase we use often, but what does that mean? Well, in practical terms, beloved, what it means is I watch more uh, Fox News than I read of my Bible. That would be setting my mind on worldly things. I spend more time on the things that are not eternal than the things that are eternal. I focus on the things that are out of my control rather than focusing on that which God has placed within the realm of my authority. So to this end, we are told not to be conformed. What does conforming mean? Conforming, I, I, in my mind, I went to that gooey paste that we give to children that they play with. Uh, it, it replaced Play-Doh because that stuff was too messy and it ruined your carpets, right? And this gooey paste that when you drop it in the, the container, it takes the shape of whatever container it's placed into. In other words, beloved, whatever you place your mind into, it will begin to take the shape of its container, if you place your mind in the things of the world, then it eventually will be conformed to that. But rather, Paul says, we are not to be conformed, but rather we are to be transformed by the renewal of our mind. That word transform means something altogether different than conform, doesn't it? In other words, the, the word transform means that you're being made completely different. The mind goes from one thing unto another. And he says that this transformation takes place through the renewal of your mind. What does the word renewal mean? It means to be made new again, renew, right? I believe that harkens us back to the creation. When Adam and Eve were in a state of ignorant bliss, God had commanded them not to eat of the tree of knowledge, for in doing so, he said, you will die. And, the moment that, and in that moment, they had one simple job to do, one simple command, obey God. Just do what God said. God said, don't eat, so don't eat. Beloved, our minds, I think Paul is saying, are to be made new again. They are to be returned to that previous estate where our only responsibility was to do what God has instructed. And what has God said? Some might even say, has God even spoken at all? Beloved, he has, and it is his word. In Jesus' high priestly prayer, in John's gospel, before his death, he prayed, that you and I, he prayed for you and me before he died. He prayed that you and I would be sanctified. And he says, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. Our minds are renewed. They are made new again. We are returned to that glorious bliss by this simple saturation of if God's word, of, of simply saturating them in God's word, God's truth. Second, with the mind, when the mind is renewed, I'm able to discern God's plans. He writes that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. We start at the end this morning. How do we know what is good and acceptable and perfect to God? He has told us in his word, hasn't he? How can I discern the will of God? 
By my mind being renewed in his word, he's told me. And in that renewal, I will know his word. And knowing his word, I will be able, he's saying, to choose between right and wrong, to choose between good and bad, to choose between what is perfect and imperfect. When you and I hear that phrase, will of God, when we think of the will of God in our lives, we have this tendency to think on the grander scale. Am I called to go to Africa, India, Japan, the ends of the earth? Am I called to teach a class? In fact, the entire Purpose Driven Life series fed this idea into people that there is this grander plan that we must all be in search of constantly in our lives. And I want to be really clear this morning. God does have grand plans for you in your life this morning, beloved. He has majestic plans, too big for you to understand, too wonderful for you to comprehend, far more grander than you might have imagined. But here's the problem. In our search for the grander, we missed the path we were supposed to be walking. Because Paul in Romans 12 lays out a path that is a day-by-day step, and it is really simple. Are you ready? Want to know what God's will is for your life? Present yourself ready for service and commit your mind to his word. It's that simple. What does God want me to do today? Present myself for service, offer myself for service, And commit my mind to his word. What's he want me to do tomorrow? Newsflash. Don't have to wait till Fox News comes out with it. Tomorrow, God wants you to present yourself for service and commit your mind to his word. And then on Tuesday, he's not going to change his mind. He wants you to do the same thing. Commit yourself to his service and put your mind in his word. And in those two simple acts, God shows us what his will is in our lives. Don't make it so complicated, beloved. Brother Roy, I'll never forget the first deer I ever harvested. And I suppose I won't forget that experience for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons is because of what happened, not in the act of harvesting the deer, but what happened in the moments that followed. Illinois, you weren't allowed to gun hunt until you were 18 years old. So you, if you wanted to harvest deer, you had to learn how to bow hunt. So my dad got me a bow at a garage sale and turned me loose, right? And he spent a couple of years chasing that elusive buck. He would put a stand up in a tree about uh, three or four foot high. There's no way you were going to kill a deer. But he put me in it, you know, made me feel better about myself. And over a couple of years, I'd gone out chasing that elusive buck. And he'd be in a stand somewhere, you know, not very far away. I decided about 14, I was going to get serious about it. So I started watching videos and seeing how they did it. Hunting, you know, hung my own stand for the first time. Even missed a few opportunities. I can't even count how many deer I totally missed, right? Spent countless hours practicing in our horse barn with my garage sale compound bow, shooting out to 25 yards because that was a long shot. So there I was on that cold October afternoon, sitting there at 14 years old in my stand, when this button buck comes running by. Now, I thought he should be mounted, but my dad disagreed. I got my bow ready. And I let the arrow fly and I watched as it shot right through the heart of the deer, just like I'd done in the barn so many times before. The deer spun around and he ran down the hill just out of sight. And in a few moments, I heard what the TV people called the crash. Excited, I climbed down from my stand and I left my stuff sitting there because it was plenty of daylight left. And I ran, literally, beloved, I I mean, I have a vivid image of this, literally ran through the woods, right, to where the deer had gone. And the reason I did all that was because I had one thing in my mind. I had one thing in my mind. The one thing I had in my mind was the prize at the end of the path. I had the end goal in my mind. I did not have the present in my mind. The only problem is that once I got down from the stand, everything looks just a little bit different than when you're perched aloft. When you get down to the ground, everything seems like it's not even the same place anymore. And after I'd been running for a little bit, I couldn't find the deer. And then all of a sudden, I noticed that I didn't even know where I was anymore. Now, these are the days long before cell phones ever existed. So there I was, 14 years old, in the middle of the woods, having no idea where I was. And I'm not ashamed to say that at 14 years old, I was bawling like a baby because I couldn't find not only the prize that I longed for, but I couldn't find my dad or where I was or my way even back to my stand. I walked around that evening for what seemed like an eternity, 
My dad thought it was about an hour. I don't really know, but it had gotten dark by that point. And I can still vividly remember the intense emotions that night of being lost. It's no feeling like it in all the world. Just overwhelmed. And suddenly, by God's grace, I looked up and I saw this light that I recognized. My dad, when he would take me out to my stand, he would always turn me around and he would say, you see that, that light there? That light is on the electric pole on the farmer's barn. I'll meet you there. So when it's dark and it's time to come down, you just turn and face that light and you just walk straight to that light. And when you get to that light, you'll find me there. So I saw that night in the midst of my lostness, I saw that light and I just started walking towards it. And then I picked up pace and I, I got there a little faster. And sure enough, minutes went by and I got there and I found my dad standing there underneath that light, frantic and in tears himself. Probably just trying to figure out how he was going to tell, his, tell my mom that she, she, he lost her favorite son. But, but he was frantic like me and he hugged me and he cried. And I told him, I said, Dad, I shot a deer and it's right down here and this is what happened. And I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, I know. <laughs> I was just over the hill. I, I already saw your deer. And I came to get you, but you weren't there. And you left all your gear sitting there in the stand, including your flashlight. Son, you know the drill. We've talked about this. Always take your gear with you. Don't look for the prize at the end of the tunnel. Look for the blood and follow the path. Look for the blood and follow the path. I am convinced that many believers are walking around aimlessly lost, frustrated, and broken because they didn't take their gear, they didn't find the blood, and they didn't follow the path. It's really that simple. You want to know what God's will is for your life. It is not complicated. It is actually quite simple. First, trust in Christ. Find the blood. Second, immerse your mind in the things of God. Corporate worship, spending time in His Word, gathering with the saints, eating dinner, lunch with the pastor, right? With other saints. Grab your gear. And third, follow the path. Present yourself ready for service. Offer your tithes. Offer your availability. Offer your life. Offer every aspect of your existence. And see if you don't find your way home. Stand with me reverently and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity you give to us in this moment to open your word and to be renewed and to be reminded again of what your call is for us in our life. It's not nearly as complicated as we so often make it into. I don't have to think about what your purpose is for my life in grander scale. You've already mapped out those grand plans that you have for us. I don't have to sit and think about whether or not I'm supposed to go to the ends of the earth or whether I'm supposed to teach a Sunday school class or just be a greeter or volunteer in children's department or offer counseling to a broken person. What I have to worry about this morning is one simple thing. Have I presented myself willingly, ready to die, as a living sacrifice before you? And the only way I can do that is if I'm committed to your word, to your truth, the rest of the time. Father, help us to be people who do your will this morning. Help us to be people who do your will. Simply, help us to be people who put our yes on the table in this moment and every moment we're moving forward and are committed to your truth. In Jesus' precious name, amen. As we sing a song of response, you respond as the Lord leads.